Um, I also want to remind everyone that next Sunday's um, Adult Enrichment is the Torah of Voting. And I know you've heard a lot about um, voting, but as we all came in during the schmooze time, there's still a couple questions we may have. Um, if you have any questions for Deerfield, ask Bob Benton, because he knows the answers to that. You can chat him. Um, and I think a lot of our, um, it's going to be homegrown. Rabbi will be here. And we'll be talking a lot about specifics and also about the Jewish values and why we should be voting. Uh, so, and then our classes start up again next week. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, this Wednesday is Eclasticies or Kohelet with Rabbi Moffick and his dad. Um, and next week we're going to have um, real Jewish classics, R-E-E-L. And um, please look in your emails to see, uh, to see what they're about and what movies, especially for Rabbi um, Ike's what movies you should be watching. And I'll be sending out more, um, I'll be sending out more emails and how to do it and this and that. So at this time, um, Manya is here. I'm going to ask her to unmute. Um, and I am going to um, give her a little introduction here. So first of all, I have to thank a couple of people. One, the Schuberts, who thank goodness are on. Um, they said, Vanessa, let's do something on cancel culture. And I said, great, do you know anyone? They're like, no. So then I went to Rabbi Evan. And I, you know, full disclosure, I did a, you know, I ran tour study. I said, listen, I, I can run tour study. You have to find me a cancel culture speaker. And he did. <laughs> and so mine is good friends with Rabbi Evan. Um, cancel Culture War, she's going to talk about it. Barry Weiss, John Cass, Nick Cannon. At what point does cancel culture cross the line? Manya is a former religion reporter and the editor at the Chicago Tribune and co-host of People of the Pod and an AJC podcast about global affairs through a Jewish lens. I highly recommend, if you don't know how to do a podcast, come see me. I adore podcasts. When you're walking, you can just listen to it. Um, and Manya's going to also discuss the role uh, different social media platforms play when it comes to managing, allowing, and removing hate speech and the different approaches to engaging with those accused of perpetuating anti-Semitic stereotypes. Mm -hmm. So um, we only have an hour. We'll take our questions um, at the end. And uh, we have, a, there's so much to discuss. And I, I was telling uh, Manya, who's out on the East Coast, that even last night on Saturday Night Live, um, the host, Bill Burr, who I wasn't, I, I didn't, he, he did not resonate with me. Um, Arthur laughed at it. And um, my husband, Manya. Uh, but even cancel culture is a thing. And Manya, now I throw it to you. I'm going to give you um, our spotlight here. And um, welcome to Macomb Solo Lakeside. Usually we'd fly you with locks and bagels and coffee and homemade sweets. But um, listen, you're, you're outside of Boston. They, they have good food, good Jewish food there too. That's right. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vanessa. It's, it's really a, a treat to be with all of you today. And don't worry, I have my coffee, so I'm, I'm all set. Um, I was absolutely thrilled to get the invite from Evan and Vanessa to speak about cancel culture today. And it's interesting. Um, you know, so yes, I know Evan. I actually Evan named both of my children. Uh, so I know Evan very well. Not only did I cover him, but he was also, he also played a personal role in our family's life. Um, I left Chicago two years ago. Um, sadly, I, it is an understatement to say how much I miss um, Chicago and my job as the religion reporter at the Tribune. Um, so it's a, it's a real treat to spend time with a Chicago area congregation again. Um, and, and to speak about a topic that I've taken a keen interest in Evan found me again because he con contacted the American Jewish Committee, not knowing that I now work for the American Jewish Committee and co-host a podcast for them, um, yes, called, called People of the Pod. So um, it's interesting. So I, I should make clear that I, I approach the subject of cancel culture from two perspectives. Yes, my former role as a reporter at the Chicago Tribune, but also my current role as, as the co-host of that podcast. And I'm going to struggle a little bit. I have to, I have to be upfront um, in terms of, of technical 
uh, savvy here. So I'm going to try to share a screen with you uh, so that you can see uh, what the website for People of the Pod looks like so that you can find it. Let's see. Uh, tell me if this works. I will tell you. Oh, okay. it's, it's start. There you go. Yay. Anya, you get an A. Woo! Okay. <laughs> so this is the website. It's ajc.org slash people of the pod where you can find all the episodes that you need to find. Um, and this, of course, is the most recent rest episode this week on Josh Kraft, um, um, who is, you know, the son of uh, the famous Patriots owner, but he's also very invested in fighting anti-Semitism through the Family Foundation. So, um, okay, so I'm going to stop share. Can you see me again now? Yes, perfect. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so I, so I approached this from two different perspectives. Um, and I, you know, I, I do believe, I, I will say as the religion reporter at the Tribune, I really didn't have um, an opportunity to understand all sides of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, to really understand Israel. I am ashamed to say I've never been to Israel, um, which I think is a huge deficiency for a religion reporter. Um, my understanding was very, very surface level. And this job with AJC has really given me the chance to immerse myself in the history of the region, the many deals that have been brokered and broken. Um, it's given me a chance to talk uh, to Israelis living on the ground there, to learn about, well, this really never crossed my radar when I was in Chicago, to learn about terrorist organizations like Hezbollah and Hamas, the real wrench that they throw into the peace process. So, you know, covering religion in Chicago gave me very few opportunities to do, to learn all of these things. And so I've been really very fortunate to have the chance to, to learn a lot. And hopefully we'll return to a newsroom one day to, uh, to, with a more, much more rounded perspective. Um, so both vantage points as a reporter, religion reporter, and as a podcaster in the Jewish world really inform my views and my interpretation of cancel culture. So I'm hoping today's conversation will, will indeed be just that, a conversation. Um, where you share examples of what you've observed, um, how they could have been handled differently, perhaps should have been handled differently, and how um, the Jewish and journalism communities can foster and cultivate more conversations about these difficult and polarizing topics. Um, so to do that, to get that conversation started, I'm hoping to hear from really more than one of you, um, since what cancel culture is and who it targets, really it honestly depends on who you ask. So. Um, who can offer a definition of cancel culture? Can I kind of open it up briefly to the audience to, to hear from you guys? Yeah, you can raise your hands. You can chat me. What is the definition of cancel culture? Okay. Don't make me, you know, I could start people, but <laughs> come on. And it doesn't have to be a full definition. It's like when someone says it, what is it even referring to in your mind? I see nobody unmuting or raising their hands. Yeah, but, Alan, okay. Alan mute. Okay. Okay, go. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm one of those Schuberts. Uh, <laughs> initially, the, re <clears throat> excuse me, the reason I proposed the topic was, to me, it was obvious with the uh, statues of the Confederacy that here was a group that was being honored who were basically traitors, resulted in the deaths of over a uh, half million Americans, and were only uh, honored to uh, show white supremacy and to put down black people. So it was obvious, yeah, this should get down. But then it sort of blossomed from there. And the question of where, is, where do you draw the line? And the more I thought about it, you could go back thousands of years, you know, to the times of the Maccabees, who was canceling whom? Were the Greeks trying to get rid of Jewish culture or were the Maccabees trying to get rid of Greek culture because it was so popular and going back to more traditional things. And in between, it could be anything. Not watching old Bill Cosby shows because of what he did today. Same thing with uh, Placido Domingo because of the, the allegation of sexual assault. And so it's, it's like, it could be defined however you want it. And the more uh, vocal you are and maybe uh, less uh, understanding of the other people's views, it could be almost anything. So that's where I come from. Okay, okay. That's awesome. I love all of those examples that you gave. You know, I also, I think of um, Michael Jackson. Am I allowed to listen to Michael Jackson yeah. music anymore? You know, and um, you know, I'm reading Charlie and the Chocolate Factory to my children right now. Am I allowed to do that? Roald Dahl was just a 
horrible anti-Semite. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the thing I mentioned to Vanessa is if you um, get rid of everybody who was either racist, xenophobic, anti-Semitic, did not want women, women to vote, you'd be left with, you know, two statues in the United States. Yeah. So where do you draw the line? Right. Excellent. Okay. Um, uh, I was uh, talking with colleagues yesterday, and we were talking about the different cancel culture people. And um, the we, you know, uh, this was not a Macomb Solo Lakeside, you know, spot. I, this isn't the feelings, but we were talking that um, Al Franken, who took himself out of the race, that I, I feel like he canceled himself too quickly. And um, I miss him, I miss his voice. And um, because he's such an upstanding, decent guy, you know, he, he just canceled himself. Hmm. And, and, and should he have? Um, I also had someone, um, oh, should I sell my Ford stock because Henry Ford was an anti-Semite? Another yeah. good comment. Yes. Very, yes. No, and that, that's, a, that's a really interesting point. Yeah, people can cancel themselves perhaps a little too soon because they are um, hypersensitive to, to these. And, and the Me Too movement really amplified cancel culture. And I'm not saying that was a good or bad thing. I'm just saying it, it really amplified um, that tendency to, um, to boot people, oust people from the public sphere. So, um, you know, I think it's important to point out that, that cancel culture works both ways. It's not a tactic of the right. It's not a tactic of the left. Millennials are not the only ones who cancel. Boomers are not the only ones who cancel. Now, I think it's safe to say all of us have probably even gone so far as to consider canceling somebody ourselves, um, or we've been the target of an attempt to cancel. Um, so I, so I, I do think that's important. I also think it's important to point out um, that there's very little room for nuance. Um, in cancel culture, um, which is a problem. Um, and it's often not merely criticizing or, or voicing disapproval of a policy or a point of view or work of art. Um, canceling really specifically refers to going after people, personalities, um, statues. It, they can even be concrete people, <laughs> uh, but, but not policies, not necessarily ideas. Um, and it's not just calling them out also with you know, vicious words or vitriol, I mean, though that's a huge part of it, um, but actively campaigning to go after people's reputations, their status, sometimes their jobs and their livelihood, if they're still alive, um, it can go down a pretty dark hole. Um, so where did this, the term and the notion of canceling come from? Um, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Schubert, the, uh, that cancel culture goes back centuries. People have even um, pulled out examples from the Talmud uh, of cancel culture. So, um, but in terms of like modern, modern day cancel culture, uh, where did this begin? And there is some disagreement on this, believe it or not. Uh, some point to uh, black Twitter saying that it started as a joke. Um, that it was really just a, a very flippant term uh, to talk about, you know, just ousting someone from you know, the, their lives. Um, President Barack Obama just last fall joked about cancel culture with a group of youth activists. And again, I'm going to try this whole screen share thing uh, and see if I can get it to work um, because I really would like for you guys to hear and watch him. When you go to sh uh, share screen, um, push this so we can hear your audio. Okay. Um, uh oh, what happened here? Yeah, hold on. There we go. All right, you said push what so that you can hear the audio? Um, it, when you go to share screen, there's a, a button at the bottom that says share audio. Got it, okay. And then I'll tell you right away if I can hear it. <laughs> I'm very confused here. For some reason, the screen is, oh, here it is, sorry. Okay. Hmm. Oh, giving me an option to share audio here. All right, we'll try it and then, um, sound maybe? Uh, you know, All worst right. case, yeah. Let's give it a try. Okay. This, this idea of purity and you're never compromised and you're always politically woke and all that stuff, I, 
you should get over that quickly. The world, the world is messy. There are ambiguities. People who do really good stuff have flaws. People who you are fighting may love their kids. I love that line. <laughs> uh, it's really it, it, that, you know, people who you're fighting may have kids, may love their kids. I mean, it just, it really humanizes it. And I think that that's, that's very important um, to remember. Um, so am I sharing the screen still? We got no. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so that's, so some people, you know, and that was just last fall, that was only a year ago, and, and President Obama was really, you know, he was addressing what he saw as, as an issue that was on the horizon that was going to be causing problems, but he did so in a, you know, lighthearted kind of humorous manner, I don't think realizing the, how serious it was going to get, you know, what, how, how it was going to peak. Now, others uh, point to Kanye West um, as, as one of the originators of cancel culture. And he really took it on the chin when he went from condemning George W. Bush for not caring about black people to expressing support for uh, Donald Trump and then calling 400 years of slavery a choice. So you can imagine uh, people were a little flummoxed uh, by this and, and offended by this. And so he said he was accusing people of, uh, of canceling him as well. So, uh, that that's where a lot that's th these are the these are the the debates that are, are going on about cancel culture is where it actually came from. Now remember what I said about cancellation, it's targeting someone's livelihood and status. And Kanye seems to be doing just fine. In fact, one could argue that um, that he wears cancellation like a badge of honor. <laughs> um, that his latest, I mean, his latest album went through the roof. Um, so it, it certainly didn't kill his sales by any stretch of the imagination. So. Um, but others say what really put the term cancel culture on the map was a letter written in July and published in Harper's Magazine that said the racial reckoning our country has been facing has intensified a new set of moral attitudes and political commitments that tend to weaken our norms of open debate and toleration of differences in favor of ideological conformity. They said this lack of open debate has created quote, an intolerance of opposing views, a vogue for public shaming and ostracism, and the tendency to dissolve complex policy issues in a blinding moral certainty, kind of that, what, what President Obama was talking about. Caustic counter speech has devolved into calls for swift and severe retribution in response to perceived transgressions of speech and thought. Now, some of you may have already uh, may have read about this Harper's letter. It was signed by some real heavyweights in the art and literature world. Margaret Atwood, Martin Amos, Barry Weiss, Malcolm Gladwell, Gloria Steinem, Cornel West, Nadine Strawson, Salman Rushdie, J.K. Rowling. Now again, these people are hardly suffering from being canceled. And that was really the critique that many delivered about this Harper's letter was that, you know, how dare these folks complain from their ivory towers and their privileged pedestals. What, you know, they're not losing anything. Um, they've, got, they've got a platform, they've got a voice. Um, and then interestingly, some authors and artists even expressed regret for signing the letter when they learned who else had signed it. For instance, J.K. Rowling, um, who, you know, the author of the Harry Potter series, who has made some very controversial statements uh, about transgender people. Um, so they, some people really wanted to remove their signatures from the letter because of that. And let me actually send you a link to the letter in the chat in case you guys have not seen it. That would help. And then I'm just seeing um, someone chatted here. I just want to make sure I'm not overlooking someone's comment. Um, um, I, I'll bring that up, but I mean, uh, thank you, Bob Batten. Um, ironic, because tomorrow is Columbus Day, now it's Indigenous People Day, and I have some type of um, United States calendar on my um, Outlook, and it came up as both, which I thought was also funny. Um, and um, in Chicago, especially, um, they're taking down statues of Columbus and um, the Italian Americans um, yesterday were um, protesting to put the Columbus statues back up, and um, it's it's a fascinating it's fascinating. Yeah, it really is. It really is. 
Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd actually forgotten that Columbus Day was was tomorrow. So yeah, this this topic will be hot tomorrow, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, so so back to these the origin of cancel culture. So people you know are pointing to Black Twitter, Kanye West, this Harper's letter. But journalist Maddie Friedman has a different theory. How many here are familiar with Maddie Friedman? I'm going to just chat this article as well from Tablet Magazine. Um, I, I can't see the show of hands. Vanessa, are there are people familiar with Maddie? Uh, um, if you can put your hands up digitally, that would. I, I don't think so. I think you. Uh, I don't see anyone wild, uh, wildly trying to get a hold of me. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Maddie Friedman is an occasional contributor to the New York Times. Um, he's also written several um, wonderful books. The one that really made me a super fan was one called Pumpkin Flowers, which is about his time in the Israeli Defense Force um, in 19, 1998. Um, between the first and second Lebanon wars, Maddie's unit was deployed to an outpost dubbed Pumpkin to secure the border between Israel and Southern Lebanon where Hezbollah forces have really um, have a grip. And he is, he's an incredible writer. Um, he, his prose are incredible. And he channels those prose through this prism of having served in, I would say two armies charged with defending democracy, the IDF and the media. And I'm sure people will argue with that, but as a journalist, uh, deep down to my core, I do believe the media is has a very important role in defending democracy. Well, he served in both. Um, he served in the Jerusalem Bureau for the Associated Press between 2006 and 2011. But he really gained fame and some ways say notoriety uh, during the Gaza conflict of 2014 when he essentially called out the Israeli press corps, the reporters, the foreign correspondents who parachute into Israel to cover what's going on there. Uh, and the outlets that send them, the media outlets that send them, for creating a false Israeli narrative, one that vilifies Israel, ignores the role of Hamas in Gaza, downplays the malevolence of Iran, the evil intentions of the Islamic Republic, portrays Hezbollah as a legitimate political player in Lebanon without acknowledging that it is a terrorist organization, and a press corps that considers really whatever NGOs and humanitarian relief organizations say about the region to be gospel. They don't question it. They don't hold those, he says, he says that these NGOs, the reporters don't hold these NGOs nearly as accountable as they do other um, agencies and entities. Now, fast forward six years, that was in 2014. Maddie now looks back at these revelations and realizes that Israel was ground zero for cancel culture. Um, this is where he argues modern cancel culture really began, the woke religion. Um, and so I tweeted out an article that he wrote about this in Tablet Magazine relatively recently that it's, it's just an interesting, it's a really interesting argument. Um, he says, whatever it is, however you want to define cancel culture, it has never been good for the Jews. Um, in fact, it has really only amplified condemnation and pushed, pushed Jews further to the margins um, and put them in more danger. And so he, he says, it's an interesting argument because as after I read the article and really, really pondered it, um, I realized there are a couple of examples to back it up right here in the United States. Um, now, there's a difference between the Black Lives Matter movement and the movement for Black Lives. And the movement for Black Lives, which emerged several years ago around the same time, um, they publicized a platform that referred to Israel as an apartheid state that commits genocide. Um, there was a dyke march, what's called the dyke march, a few years ago for gay rights. Um, there in Chicago, I was still there. I was covering religion. And um, they, they basically outlawed no rainbow or outlawed rainbow flags with the Star of David. Uh, marchers showed up and wanted to, to carry these rainbow flags with the Star of David. And they said, no, those aren't allowed because that's symbolic of uh, an, an oppressive state. Um, and according to the founders of the Women's March, um, you, may you may remember um, one of them referred to Louis Farrakhan from the Nation of Islam as the, uh, one of the greatest of all time. So if you're one of those Jews who believes you have a right to self-determination and a homeland and that Israel has a right to exist, you're canceled. <laughs> um, I thought those examples were pretty illustrative of what Maddie was arguing. So 
Um, but I'd like to talk about three examples um, in more recent months where some argue cancel culture played a role or could have and didn't. Um, and I'd like to start with a, a more local situation for you guys. Um, I would like to talk about my colleague, my former colleague at the Tribune, John Cass. Um, how many of you, again, if I could get a digital show of hands, Vanessa, if you can let me know. Um, let how, me many know. Of, how many of you read John Cass? Oh, we're getting more hands for this. Okay. Um, or, or how many people? He's a controversial figure. Yes, he is. Yes, see, as every columnist should be, let's face it. Okay. <laughs> I would argue. I, my husband just whispered to me, I don't like him. <laughs> <laughs> so he is definitely controversial. He is. Well, let me ask you this. So, so my first question was, how many of you read John Cass? How many of you read John Cass because you agree with him? Yeah, I'm not getting anything now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, somebody said, Andy said occasionally here in the chat. <laughs> right, 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 right. Oh, no, she does not agree with him. Oh, oh no, okay. <laughs> I, right. You, I, you I, read I, him occasionally I, and you never agree with him. <laughs> exactly. That's because um, I know Andy well. Well, and then I was going to ask, how many of you read him just because you believe it's important to read different points of view and just know what the other side might be thinking, even if you don't agree with him very yeah. often? Yeah. Yeah, people okay. are raising their hands for that. Yeah. And okay. Then, yeah, that's a that's a great point. Okay. So so I will I will preface this with um, um, John Cass. Even when you read John Cass's column, it may be hard for some of you to fathom. He is a mensch. Um, I I adore John. Um, we, and, but yes, have, John we have we have one common. John Cass is a hater of liberals and shit. I know you that that is definitely the impression he gives in his column. Absolutely. <laughs> I cannot agree more. Um, but just knowing him personally and as a colleague at the Tribune, I he was always good to me and um, I, he was a colleague, um, and even if he had points of view that I didn't necessarily agree with. Um, but he wrote a column this summer about billionaire philanthropist George Soros. How many of you have, were familiar with this with this column that he wrote? Um, actually, I'm going to send a link out just so you guys Wait, can see it. it. Hopefully this works. Um, so yep. in this column, he was basically calling out um, the lawlessness, the, the lack of law and order uh, in Chicago at the time as riots were breaking out in the streets. Um, statues were coming down, statues of Columbus. Um, and uh, he was basically saying that, hey, this, this didn't erupt out of nowhere. The, these rioters um, uh, have uh, uh, backing, excuse me, financial backing. And that financial backing comes from none other than George Soros. Um, he says, you know, these democratic cities, he had, he named a couple of cities in the, in the, in his column are also where left wing billionaire George Soros has spent millions of dollars to help elect liberal social justice warriors as prosecutors. He remakes the justice system in urban America flying under the radar. Now, some people read that flying under the radar phrase as just another version of the hidden hand trope which is a longtime anti-Semitic canard that it can be found actually in the protocols of the elders of Zion, uh, which of course is the fabricated text that QAnon has embraced about Jews secretly controlling the world. Um, and they, they saw this column as clearly containing some dog whistles um, that were not appropriate for uh, a columnist to be using and that editors frankly should have flagged before the column made it to um, to, to to see before the column saw the saw the light of day and many immediately called for John's head um, including the paper's own union um, that John intentionally avoided joining um, because of his political views uh, but there is another side to this um, while one could argue John's column was factually thin many argue that Many of John's columns are factually thin, but it um, this column in particular, it never labeled George Soros as being Jewish. Was he made to be a boogeyman? Was he accused of, of doing things? Yes. Is it a thin line? Oh yes, very thin line. But even thin lines count. And to condemn a colonist for having a point of view that wealthy philanthropists, philanthropists excuse me, are funding violence in the streets one could argue he's entitled to that point of view, even if you don't agree with that. 
Um, but there really was no debate. There really was no argument or conversation, really you, breaking down um, what makes criticism of George Soros legitimate, what makes it anti-Semitic. Um, there were calls for his head, but there wasn't really anything more, I would say, informative, constructive um, about after this column. Uh, he, of course, wrote a column to respond to the criticism, which I will also chat here in case you missed it. Um, and in this column, he calls out cancel culture, of course. Most people subjected to cancel culture don't have a voice. They're afraid. They have no platform. Um, when they're shouted down, they're expected to grovel. After the groveling comes social isolation, and then they are swept away but I have a newspaper column. Now I'm not defending John and someone mentioned in the chat that he has never apologized to, to Jews. Um, I think John would argue that he doesn't need to and I'm not defending his argument, believe me. Um, but he would say he doesn't need to because he didn't call George Soros Jewish. He didn't call out his, his religion or ethnicity and doesn't believe that he included an anti-Semitic dog whistle in his column. Again, I think there needs to be, there needed to be a, a more constructive conversation around this. Um, I'm, def I'm, again, I'm not defending John, I'm defending the need for an open conversation. Um, that's what seemed to be missing here. Um, I encourage all of you to listen. Um, it, it was really by pure coincidence that the week after all of this erupted, I interviewed the author of a book uh, called The Influence of Soros, Power, Politics, and the Struggle for an Open Society, Emily Tampkin. Um, I interviewed her on the podcast. There's a link to that particular podcast episode. Um, and we talked about whether or not, you know, any criticism, all criticism of Soros is anti-Semitic, or is there legitimate criticism of Soros? And she talks about what's legitimate, what crosses the line into anti-Semitism, and really kind of gives the background of who George Soros is and um, and who, you know, and, and how this all came to be. It is a fascinating journey of how George Soros became the boogeyman uh, for uh, all of these liberal causes and, and how uh, even governments, even his own former government, the Hungarian government, has um, really vilified George Soros in a very anti-Semitic ways. Um, but it's, it's an interesting interview. And I, I just, I wish that there had just been more conversation like this um, around it instead of a, um, you know, the union calling for his head. And by the way, I helped form that union and I, it's one of my, I'm very proud of that accomplishment before I left having contributed to that. But um, I was a little concerned that they had, had called for a colleague's head without you know, at least offering, you know, opening up a conversation or suggesting workshops to help editors recognize anti-Semitism when they see it. There was just a, a more constructive way to handle it. That's my opinion. Um, another controversy that I want to address, rather similar, is that of Barry Weiss, uh, the author of How to Fight Anti-Semitism and a former columnist at the New York Times, until she very publicly resigned this past summer. Um, Barry alleged in, in her resignation from the Times that Twitter had become the Times' ultimate editor, uh, even though it didn't have a spot on the masthead. Uh, stories are chosen, they're told through a particular lens to satisfy an audience rather than to open minds and let readers formulate their own conclusions. Um, I, I am, you know, this seemed like a, a, a kind of an amplified version of what I saw in my 15 years at the Tribune, you know, this need to, to satisfy the audience, to give the audience what it wanted instead of sometimes giving it the medicine that it needed. As a religion reporter, I, in particular, I felt that was very important that people needed to, um, to learn about different religious traditions and, and take some bitter pills sometimes, take some bitter medicine to, to really learn. Um, but this seemed like um, this situation had really been amplified at the Times, the way Barry wrote it. Now, again, I'm going to send you a link to um, Barry's resignation letter. I hope I just sent it. I'm not sure. Did I send it or did I just resend a, the podcast link? Sorry about that. It's right there. I'm clicking on all the links and they're all there. Oh, there it is. Okay, okay, great. Um, so Barry says in the resignation letter, my own forays into wrong think have made me the subject of constant bullying by colleagues who disagree with my views. 
They have called me a Nazi and a racist. I have learned to brush off comments and how I'm writing about the Jews again. Several colleagues perceived to be friendly with me were badgered by coworkers. My work and my character are openly demeaned on company-wide Slack channels, which is a inner office uh, communication, where masthead editors regularly weigh in. There, some coworkers insist I need to be rooted out if this company is to be a truly inclusive one, which, while others post ax emojis next to my name. Now, again, I mentioned that the Tribune's union went after John Cass. This is kind of the same, um, this is the same dynamic that, that seems to be playing out in the Times newsroom, that colleagues are going after colleagues and um, that it's not, you know, they're, they're not, that colleagues are going after colleagues. That's just, that's, that's uh, the, the fact. Um, at, with this moral certitude, this moral certainty, instead of this openness to different points of view. So, and you know, I, I remember hearing from other people who had since left the Times and we talked about the newsrooms that we had left behind. And they said, this is a, it, the, the newsroom that Barry Weiss described was not the newsroom that they worked, had worked in when they were working at the Times. And I would say the same thing about the Tribune. It was not the newsroom I worked in just two years ago, a newsroom that calls for John's head. Um, were there people who disagreed with the politics of the opinion page? Absolutely. And that's why we didn't work on the other side of the wall. We worked in the newsroom. Um, but there does seem to be this kind of development of a very, almost a very vocal thought police, maybe a, a harsh, a too harsh a term, but um, this, this moral certitude that's, that's kind of bubbling up in the newsroom itself and saying um, that you don't need both sides of the story, or as I would argue, all 13 sides of the story. There, need, there you need to be more analytical and, and, and go into it with you know, a, a, moral, um, a moral lens um, into the stories that you write. And I just, I, that's foreign to me. That's, that's a, it's a completely new development, totally foreign to me. Um, because who's to say who's right and who's, what's moral? Um, so I'm going to share a link um, in, in the chat again to one of my favorite columns by Barry Weiss back in 2018 about connecting in person uh, with a Twitter follower who despised her, or you would think she despised her on Twitter. Um, and because that's the impression that it gives, right? That's, that's whoops, I'm sorry. No. That's the impression that it gives, uh, that Twitter gives is that uh, people, Either you either love them or you hate them. And um, Barry wrote a lovely column about meeting this woman in person, and um, and really getting to know her and learning that she actually really liked her a lot. <laughs> they had a lot in common, even if not politically. <clears throat> in the third, it's a good segue. <clears throat> excuse me. Into the third incident that I'll describe, which has a happy ending. Um, Nick Cannon. Uh, how many of you know Nick Cannon? Any show? Of, any show of hands? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Um, so Nick Cannon, for those who don't know, he's the host of a very, or was the host of a very silly but stupidly fun game show called uh, The Masked Singer. And um, he also has his own podcast called Cannon's Class, which uh, airs on YouTube. He has a YouTube channel. And in fact, one of Chicago's very own was on Cannon's Class recently, uh, Father Michael Flager. Uh, they actually shot, or didn't shoot, uh, recorded the podcast right inside St. Sabina Catholic Church. Um, and so uh, he is, he, he really, uh, it's, it's a very popular uh, podcast and show on YouTube. And, but before he interviewed Father Flager, he interviewed a rap star known as Professor Griff, who was kicked out of a rap group called Public Enemy back in 1989 when I was listening to things rapish. Uh, after publicly declaring that Jews were responsible for the majority of wickedness that goes on across the globe. And throughout his interview on the podcast, on the Cannon's Class podcast, Nick Cannon you know, was affirming Professor Griff, everything that he, he was saying. He was repeating all the anti-Semitic conspiracy theories that he was spouting, um, you know, the, the power that, you know, why do we give so much power to the theys and then the theys turn into Illuminati and the Zionists and the Rothschilds and yeah, so he caught a lot of a lot of flack um, and was fired from a number of his gigs. But the story does not end there, thankfully. Um, 
Now, I should note that Nick is a student at Howard University's School of Divinity, which makes his comments even more troubling that here he is a, uh, a, 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 excuse me, here he is not just an entertainer, but a divinity school student, someone who wants to become a religious leader uh, saying these things. So um, he, but he went onto social media and really announced that he was engaging in a process of atonement. He apologized. He reached out to rabbis and teachers to really school him on where he went wrong. Um, he followed AJC on Twitter, uh, among other uh, places on uh, other social media channels. And when he did that, AJC reached back to him and invited him in for an in-person conversation. I've already referred to the in-person meeting between Barry uh, and this woman. Well, believe it or not, in-person conversations can be pretty powerful. And so he sat down for in-person meetings with our, um, our National Director for Combating Anti-Semitism. He sat down with Rabbi Noah Marins, who is our Director of Intergroup and Interreligious Relations. Um, and then he and Noam later did an hour-long public program. Um, it's a series that we call Advocacy Anywhere, where they dissected, really, really dissected what Nick had come to believe was the truth, the factual truth about a central banking system controlled by the Rothschild family. He really believed this was true. And why did he believe this was true? Because he was an avid listener and follower of Louis Farrakhan, um, who arguably has done many positive things for people on, the Chicago, on Chicago's South Side. Um, he has done many positive things for the African-American community, but he spouts and spews anti-Semitic vitriol and has done so for years. Um, and that is woven into his message. It's just baked into his message, really. And Nick Cannon and others had just soaked it up. And he really did think that was true. And so in engaging with Jewish leaders, he learned that no, it's not true at all. These are anti-Semitic, um, false. Um, so it was really, it, it, it created a, a relationship and a, a real um, visible uh, transformation um, in Nick Cannon, who, you know, by the way, is, is still quite influential. It really, even though he was canceled, um, he really, he wasn't. Um, his influence is still, you know, he's still shaping minds and, and opinions out there. And so we're, we're hoping that this particular interaction will be um, transformational and will spread, um, that he will, he will be a, a teacher himself. You know, Cannon uh, even dined in Noam's sukkah uh, last week, and I believe Noam was on Cannon's class. It hasn't aired yet, but I believe he sat down and did a, one of the Cannon's class podcasts as well. Um, but Noam really, uh, he said it best in a column that he wrote for JTA, which is the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, and I'll send you a link to that as well. But I'll also read a quote from that column. Noam wrote, responsible Jewish leaders do not have the luxury of missing this opportunity. If we allow ourselves to be frozen in a cancel culture that does not give Canon a chance to reach his people, we should be condemned by our people whom we are supposedly leading. And I think that really sums it up. Conversation and dialogue, I mean, that's how we're going to transcend boundaries, um, understand each other, turn the volume down, turn the pressure down in this pressure cooker that uh, is now America. Um, but first we really, we have to transcend cancel culture. And I think that that is really, um, that's, that's the first item of business. So, so we, have, we have some questions coming yeah, I'm gonna stop and also a comment. Um, first of all, there was a football player who had some anti-Semitic remarks. I can't remember his name. And then a Jewish football player, and Taka, there's not so many of them, uh, reached out to him and, and they had a conversation. This idea mm -hmm. of having a conversation is so important. Um, but Lynn w wants to know, what about the thought that cancel culture has arisen because of the hate brought about by Trump and the current administration? and? Yeah. No, I think that's, I think what has happened is, well, remember I said it's not a tactic of the right, it's not a tactic of the left. Both are guilty. Um, even Trump himself called out cancel culture when he was uh, out in front of um, uh, Mount Rushmore, you know, giving his July 4th speech. Um, but I think both sides are, are guilty of it. I think what has happened um, in the last 
five years, six years, has been just this black and white, uh, no gray area in the middle and just this, um, yeah, you're wrong, I'm right attitude. No room for nuance, no room for uh, conversation and, and open debate. I think that's what's happened and it's just become more polarized. So I, I don't know, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to blame uh, Trump for you know, creating the cancel culture, but he's certainly created, in, uh, his and his campaign tactics have certainly created uh, the environment for it. Very good. Alice, go ahead. Yeah, what I was thinking when I was listening to you, Mina, was, um, I, and I know a lot of people are, are familiar with this, um, Derek Black, who spoke at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial luncheon, the white supremacist who has now renounced it. Right. So his book, Rising Out of Hatred, I read it and my husband's reading it now and we were talking about it last night and my husband, I think, made a really good point. He said the way that Derek was changed was by the relationships that he made. Yes. And, you know, it took a long time, but the people that he met at college, you know, they made relationships with him before they tried to change him. They didn't just go after him and, and it worked. So I think your point about the relationships and dialogue, I think that's the most important thing. You know, and it's scary because um, the pandemic is really <laughs> uh, limiting that, right? I mean, we, it's limited us to social media. Uh, you know, a lot of people are leaving Facebook right now because of the revelations about the Facebook company and that movie Social Dilemma. I still haven't seen it. I almost don't want to watch it because I might want to leave Facebook. And that's my only connection to people. <laughs> and and people are, are posting, you know, I'm leaving, goodbye. And I'm like, can I have your email? This is the only way I can connect with you. So I think that's, that's sad. Um, but it, it limits those personal interactions. And I think, again, amplifies the, the and creates this environment for this cancel culture to, to really get out of hand. So. Um, so we have a couple of questions coming in. We had one before about is BDS a part of cancel culture? Oh. And um, Maddie Schubert said, how does cancel culture differ from um, or fit in with boycotting? And um, also someone would like to hear your opinion of the New York Times editor who was fired for printing the column by uh, Senator Tom Cotton. Yes, thank you. So yeah, so BDS, I would definitely say is, is an example of, of cancel culture. Um, it's, uh, you know, trying to, again, to delegitimize Israel um, by, um, you know, boycotting it, um, uh, injuring it economically, um, and trying to, to undermine its existence, um, instead of really engaging and trying to learn all different, all 13 sides of that, of that complex story. Um, and trying to come up with with more constructive ways, um, you know. I and I will say, um, as a reporter, I um, I have learned. I, I didn't learn enough about BDS. I, I will I will admit. Um, when I was covering that, I I really it is a complex story, and you really have to understand it. And I didn't really see BDS as much of a problem when I was. I thought, oh, that's a great political a way of politically. Um, uh, you know, campaigning, showing, voicing your, uh, your values, and why not? And then I, I learned after that, <laughs> uh, there's a lot more to the story, and it really it is, a, is a wonderful example, actually, of cancel culture. Um, the Tom Cotton op-ed, what are my views of that? So I believe, again, that a newspaper should really be shining a light on all different points of view, agreeable and disagreeable. Um, and I disagreed with the, I, I, I thought that that op-ed should have run. Um, now, I also think that James Bennett should have read it before it ran. <laughs> um, I, I do believe that, again, agreeable and disagreeable points of view, that's what a newspaper's opinion pages is for. And, but I do think that the editor should have read it, should have questioned some of the factual errors in it, um, made him back it up a little bit more. And um, yeah, yeah, I mean, there are, <laughs> these days, facts are, you know, people are not in that, that great line. 
that Vice President Pence repeated at the debate, um, <laughs> the you know, people are entitled to their own opinions, but not their own facts. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> the, uh, but yeah, I, I think that Bennett should have read it. Do I, did I think it was a fireable offense? I didn't, um, actually. I think that uh, there was a, there's a lot going on. I will say this is the danger of having a newsroom just spread out, right? Everybody's working remotely. So many great conversations and huddles happen in the newsroom uh, where you bounce things off of each other and things get caught um, before you know, they go to press. And I think that that's, this was one of the, the side effects of that, unfortunately. Fascinating. Susan, you have a question or a comment? You're, you're muted. There you go. I thought I, I'm sorry, I thought I unmuted. Um, so I'm wondering how many people, and also you, Manya, if you have read yesterday's uh, column, uh, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal by Joseph Epstein. No, it I was about, uh, the, about intolerance. But it was all, um, I happen to know him personally. I've known him since we were children. And his real name is Myron. Where Joseph came from, I'll never know. But at any rate, um, <laughs> that's just an aside. His whole column was kind of attacking liberals for their intolerance. Mm. There was nothing about intolerance from the right which of course led me to believe that, oh goodness, my old friend is a real conservative. <laughs> but um, I, I was really astonished by, by, by the column and I don't know how many others have read it. And if you haven't, I would suggest you try to get it and read it, it's very interesting. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for calling my attention to it. No, I did not. Uh, I mean, definitely about, I think it, it ref reflects cancel culture, mm -hmm. but in a very negative way about liberal thinking. Does it call out cancel culture, basically, but, but saying no, it blaming liberal? Use it. it uses it as intolerance. Okay. And it in, he calls it intolerance by the so-called tolerant people. That those of us who think we are so tolerant of other people's attitudes are completely intolerant when it comes to peoples, for instance, who say they're pro-life. Hmm. Uh, or he gives a, a number of different examples. Mm -hmm. and, but they're all liberal, you know, attacking liberal examples. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Which is probably why the Wall Street Journal ran it. I mean, they tend to, they tend to embrace conservative points of view. Um, but I just wonder if that column if it ran alongside a liberal attacking conservative approaches, if no. it would appear more balanced. No, and I think that's one of the problems. I think that's one of the problems with the media today and also with um, TV and radio media that they will have, for instance, a, a liberal or I, I especially notice it when it's an Israeli that they have. Uh, they have an Israeli that they interview and uh, or they have a Palestinian that they interview or so, or somebody appropriate, but they wait two or three days until they have someone from the other side to rebut. Well, the same people aren't listening on the same days, mm -hmm. and I think that's a big negative. They need to. I don't know if you agree with that or not. I think they need to. It needs to be balanced. Yep. But when you separate it by days, it's not balanced. Right. Um, we have another question here. Does cancel culture primarily run through the college student population? Hmm. Um, so no, I, I, I do not believe so. I, I think that it's, it's easy to uh, point to the millennials and the Gen Zers <laughs> uh, and say that they're, they're responsible for this, but they're not. Um, there are plenty of, of, of boomers and Gen Xers uh, who are who are embracing this? I mean, we're all on social media. We're all watching videos on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook, um, and that really is exacerbating this. And um, I know I, I don't think that it's it's only through the college student population, um, but certainly uh, that is where a lot of indoctrination happens on college campuses. I think there is 
certainly a problem on college campuses where um, students are not getting the full story. You know, they've got other they've got other priorities, right? I mean, you know, well, uh, even during a pandemic, they've got bars to visit. I mean, they're <laughs> um, they're they're the priorities are perhaps not in the right place. And so they are targeted. And I would say there is definitely, I have learned there is definitely a, uh, a the BDS campaign has definitely targeted college campuses and they do not give all sides of the story. And students just um, just swallow whatever is, is being fed to them and without really learning um, the ins and outs of it. Yeah, as we get towards the end of the hour here, uh, I was literally praying that one of our rabbis would come on and both of them I know are going to watch this Manya and we have a lot going on at back at the building with our kids are in religious school. Uh, but the, the Jewish concept of teshuva, um, repentance, and, you know, I would say that Nick Cannon, um, you know, made tshuva, and some of these other, you know, I also, you know, I brought up Al Franken before, but I think some of these people have, and then there's other people, Weinstein, who show no remorse, mm -hmm. um, and so it, that's how I place it in my Jewish values. Um, also, Evie said to us, what balanced outlets would you recommend? Mm. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a great question. Balanced. Um, well, I mean, and of course, not fair and balanced <laughs> as in the Fox News quote. Listen, I think NPR does a wonderful job. Um, and before I forget to tell people, I, I, I want to make sure there is a new podcast series on NPR. And actually, I should send you the link um, that I just interviewed it, at WBEZ there in Chicago has a wonderful reporter by the name of Odette Youssef. She's also a dear friend. Um, she did worked on it for about a year on the podcast series Motive. Yes, I see Alice. <laughs> <laughs> on um, the origins of the roots of white supremacy there in Chicago. And I interviewed Odette on People of the Pod. I also interviewed um, the editor of Slate, who did um, his podcast on David Duke. Um, and the, it's both are fascinating podcasts. And I, I highly recommend that you, you seek those out and listen to them. Um, I listened to the one with Odette, and it happened to come out after Trump's Proud Boy statement. And I was like, Manya, that was yeah. unbelievable. She goes, listen, I've been working on that for a long time. She's been working on this for a long time. But when you see this confluence of what, you know, you're working on, and then it, it keeps happening. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Which the same was true with Emily Tampkin's book on George Soros. Here, I just sent the link to that particular People of the Pod episode, and then you okay. can find the, both podcasts via uh, the show notes. But yeah, it, it was really, same thing was, was true with Emily Tampkin and her George Soros book. She started working on it years before people really embraced George Soros as uh, the boogeyman. Um, that uh, they, they have made him to be. You know, listen, the Washington Post is still a wonderful publication, um, still a, a wonderful, wonderful media outlet. I would say the New York Times is also a wonderful publication. They've made some questionable decisions, um, but I, I still think that the quality of their news is, is fabulous. Uh, and NPR, that's uh, what led me to saying this, you know, NPR is, is a wonderful outlet that I think has a lot of, you know, now, all three, I'm sure, conservatives would say are liberal publications. Um, I think that, um, you know, I think the Wall Street Journal is actually a wonderful um, publication. I think all of them are guilty of, they're not perfect. I think all of them are guilty of imbalance, um, either on their opinion pages or, um, you know, in their, in their news coverage. There definitely is a lens. And, um, but still, I, th I think the key is knowing that. And, and, and reading them with that in mind and then seeking out the opposite points of view just to get right. a fuller picture. Um, I would also say, and I'm gonna add Ynet News is, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's my personal kid trying to call me. Um, Ynet News gives you, I think, a more balanced view of Israel. Mm -hmm. And it's very critical of Israel, yet very supportive. And it's also kind of on the ground of what's happening. And I'll include that. Someone said, um, I've been um, pressing on the links and I've got all of them. Plus we're recording this. So I will try to get those links out because there was so much good information. Okay. Um, and, um, you know- And I would have to interrupt. But I would add Times of Israel too. Is is a good publication. That's a little right. It's a little <laughs> right. Just know that, Manya. It's a little right. Well, 
I, I, but I would not as right as Jerusalem Post, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, in Israel, center is really right and left is really center. I mean, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, and I think a good ending question is, does cancel culture involve an action versus just your own value system? Oh, repeat that again. Does cancel culture involved an action versus just your own value system? It's in the hmm. chat. You can look at it. Um, in other words, are you guilty of cancel culture if you're if you're thinking <laughs> that, um, uh, that somebody should should take a hike? Um, no, I, I don't. I don't. I think it's an action. I think it's it's publicly trying to oust someone, demote someone, take away their status. I mean, I think specifically about that woman in Central Park, who, um, that, that's like the darkest hole that I can think of, is um, the woman in Central Park who, who went after the African-American birder and called the police and, and made up statements about him attacking her and he, he was filming her the whole time. She lost her job um, over that and was really just, um, she and who's who's going to hire her now after being so publicly shamed um even the guy who did it even the guy who filmed her and had that interaction with her didn't think that she should be losing her job over it um it's it's that kind of uh attack um so i would say it's more action um i think things all the time that i that i would never air publicly but you know do i voice them um no i i really try to become more informed about it so yeah. We have a lot, you know, what about news on public TV? Would you say they cancel culture as a reaction to such extreme times of untruths, thereby encouraging the need to defend? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that, do I think that, do I, I'm sorry, do I think that the news on public TV I, is... I, I don't know, is slant, I, that was from Gail. I'm not 100% sure what, I'm just reading out what she said. Okay, let's see, let me see the chat, chat here. Yeah, go into the chat, you can see. Um, <clears throat> while um, Manya is looking at her last answers, uh, just a quick commercial that Michael Oren is gonna be here. And yeah, except, let's, now he was an ambassador to Israel and I'm sorry, ambassador from Israel to America, but he was, um, you know, he's, you know, was born here. Um, but he is only speaking about his new book, The Night Archer. So you have two weeks to try to get a hold of that book. But he's going to be here on October 25th. And I am going to read, I have the book, and I'm going to read every one of those books until I can find something political in there. But don't tell him I said that. Okay. Um, go ahead, Manya. Well, I was going to say, you know, do I do I feel that, that that media organizations feel the need to defend? Um, I do think they need to defend themselves. Um, I think that you know, I will. Oh my gosh, this was 25 years ago. I was on the board of the uh, Society of Professional Journalists, the National Board, and I remember it was I was a student journalist at the time. I remember there being a conversation about should we do a public information campaign, like hire the Ad Council to do a public information campaign about journalism and the importance of journalism, the role it plays in democracy. And they never did, but boy, looking back, they should have, they, and they still should. Um, listen, journalism is a, is a key component of our democracy, and it has really taken a beating over the past five or six years. Um, I don't think people trust the media. Some of it is self-inflicted. Some of the wounds are self-inflicted, um, absolutely. But I think that um, people have, have lost sight of the role journalists play, the risks they take to bring information to people. Um, and then there's so much misinformation out there. I, you know, there's, there is a group um, that I volunteered for when I was in Chicago called uh, uh, News Literacy Council. And it, it's, it's um, I, I think that there does, you know, they, they do education in the schools, they teach, middle school kids, high school kids, how to detect misinformation out there and how to, to find what's actually true. Um, and I just think that there needs to be more of that. Um, and yes, I, I do think that the media feels a need to defend itself uh, because it does. <laughs> um, but there are ways to go about doing that without throwing off the balance completely and, and forgetting what their actual job is to do. Uh, we can't thank you enough, Manya. What a rich conversation. 
Um, I always like to say this is just the beginning. I will send out the links. Um, people should keep researching and keep talking about it because I think one thing that came up this morning is that we need to talk. Uh, this morning I had on Fox News because I need, I can't take a lot of it, but uh, you need to see, we need to see what everybody's talking about it and the more discussions, the more, the more. So um, we wish everybody a good week, a safe week, a healthy week. Thank you, thank you, Manya. Listen to her podcast. Go back and get that one with Odette. And people are coming in with all the thank yous, Manya. So oh, good. Thank you. I, I feel like I know you. Hope one day we'll meet in person. I so, and when I can, when I can fly to Chicago again one day. Yes, that'd be fantastic. Okay. If there bye, are bye, any, everyone. If we'll see you this remaining, week. If there are any remaining questions, please don't hesitate to send them to Vanessa. If there's something I didn't address, I'll certainly do my homework and try to address it responsibly. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank everybody. you. Bye-bye.